Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. As mentioned, the IMF is pushing Sri Lankan officials to go for a local debt restructuring measure. Now the funny part is that the IMF is saying, nope, we are not getting our hands wet with the local debt restructuring, but you must do it. IMF is one such organization that they don't have an accountability measure built in with their proposals. So like, in case we implement these five key points from which uh, from the IMF, which I spoke about earlier, and if it fails so badly that Sri Lanka's economy goes bust, then there is no way we can hold the IMF accountable for their erroneous policies. I hope and pray that those policies work for the benefit of the 22 million people of this country. But history sadly dictates that it is not the case. Argentina, Peru, Zambia, Kenya, South Korea, and Mexico. These are some of the countries that went to the IMF and got their bum handed over to them with wrong policies. Later, they woke up and fixed their economies that benefited them the most. Argentina, still reeling from problems. Let's get more on this. Joining me now uh, from New York, USA, via Zoom, is Professor of Economics at the New School for Social, uh, Social Research in New York City, Pl Professor Clara Matei. Professor, thank you for being here. Good to see you once again. Now, the IMF is asking Sri Lanka to restructure its local debt. The banks here are crying foul, saying that this will indeed put uh, this country's banking system at risk. Despite the warnings, now, Professor, we see that the government uh, seems to be moving in that direction. What is your assessment of this? Is this a correct move to uh, restructure local debt? Mahesh, thank you so much for having me. Well, out of principle, the idea of pushing for debt restructuring is a very, very important one. And it's one that activists in Sri Lanka have tried to um, push for, and not just activists, but also economists who are trying to actually help Sri Lanka gain back economic sovereignty. So out of principle, uh, debt restructuring is strong because it's saying it's the creditors for once, which is very rare. It's the creditors who have to pay the burden of the economic situation and not, as it's usually done, the common people. Now, the issue here is that, of course, the IMF is putting, is pushing for local debt restructuring, um, which is not really where the core of the problem lies because the core of the problem is foreign um, debt and it's foreign creditors that indeed the IMF represents. So the IMF is a foreign force who is coming into the country and it's very strong what they did just on the 16th of May, they had a hearing in Sri Lanka in which it's clear that they're there to monitor um, this situation in order to enforce um, a type of restructuring that does not hit the foreign countries. Actually, this is very problematic because what we know is that the country has defaulted on its foreign debt. And also that we know that the problem here is the fact that Sri Lanka is not implementing measures that are actually keeping um, foreign capital in check. We know that the deregulation that has brought about capital flight, not just capital flight um, legal capital flight in the form of interest on debts that flying out of the country, right? It's also all this illegal capital flight that has actually made it such that there were $40 billion that left the country that are actually more than the amount that the country owned to the foreign investors. Indeed, uh, Professor, and now the IMF, uh who are, seems to be the current owners of Sri Lanka, has proposed certain policies to implement. Most economies, uh, certainly not the liberal ones, but others see their policies as harmful. Who benefits the most from these policies, Professor? So, um, Mahesh, unfortunately, we are back in the same refrain, the same dogma, which is the dogma of austerity. The IMF talks about structural reform. What's this implies, even if it's never said, is austerity with a capital A, which is all about shifting resources away from the people in favor of the saver investors, and especially in favor, as we just said, of international predators. So what are these policies all about? They're about constantly deregulating, constantly privatizing, making thus the country more dependent on the international markets, and also um, increasing the taxes on the people, 
increasing consumption taxes. We know that the government in Sri Lanka has done this very much. The VAT has gone up to 15% last summer. Uh, with this, there's also constant cuts in social expenditures. And, um, and of course, we also see the fact that the bank of, of uh, the bank, a central bank in Sri Lanka is increasing the interest rates. All of these policies are policies that are harmful for the people. People are losing their jobs. People have less social benefits. Right now, public transportation in Sri Lanka is so bad that uh, I've read many interviews of moms not being able to send their kids to school. So the situation is a humanitarian crisis that the IMF is um, solving with more uh, fuel for a greater humanitarian crisis. So what is very important here is to understand the IMF, even if it uses very technical jargon, a jargon that seems very objective and neutral and scientific, is actually proposing a very political warfare against the citizens of Sri Lanka in favor of the few. And this, by the way, is not going to help the situation in Sri Lanka because economists very well know that austerity brings about recession. And so this is only going to increase the burden of the debt, is only going to make Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka worse off in the future. Sri Lanka has been doing austerity for the last 30, 40 years. And what we're seeing now is the result of austerity. So more austerity is only going to make situation worse for the Sri Lankan people. But of course, a situation that is good for the foreign creditors who can keep Sri Lanka in uh, even more of a blackmail, even more in a, in, in a threat of not giving it money. Absolutely. Uh, Professor, whether we like it or not, uh, the United States is still the dominant economy and we are now seeing massive cracks in the banking system and the economy there. Of course, uh, they are on the brink of a default, which I don't think will really happen, but it shows the stress on the system. So how do you analyze the U.S. economy at this stage and its impact on the world? It's really interesting because the United States are leading uh, the monetary austerity wave with the interest rate hikes of the Fed. Um, this interest rate hikes are, of course, meant to kill the bargaining power of workers in the United States. The Fed officials are wishing for unemployment rates to go up so that they can discipline workers and keep wages down. So they want the labor market to run smoothly. And in a capitalist system for labor market to run smoothly means that people need to accept more precarious conditions and lower wages. Now, what we're seeing right now is that what's interesting is that this dose of monetary austerity also has the effect of causing um, some instability in the financial markets. But what's interesting is that the Fed is willing to pay the price of instability in financial markets because the primary objective here is to make sure that the people go back to work for a low wage. And of course, what the IMF is doing, uh, sorry, the IMF, what the Treasury and the, and the Central Bank in the United States are doing is then spreading around the world to the point that Sri Lanka and other countries, of course, have to de be, do even more um, monetary austerity in order to avoid their currency to to uh, lose value. Now, one more point to make is that this um, bank unsettlement that is happening in the United States is functioning to kill the small banks and centralize power in the big banks. So JP Morgan Chase has won massively from this interest rate hikes because the small banks are uh, seeing capital are seeing capital flights run on banks because they have been investing in treasury bonds and these treasury bonds have lost value uh, the old the ones that had maturity for a long time so now what we're seeing is fundamentally that uh, big banks are gaining power and it's economic and political power. There's a symbiosis between JP Morgan Chase and the American government. And I think this helps us think that it's false to think that the markets are separate from governments. What the United States case shows is that the state and the market are working together to secure the power of the elite against the people. And this is true both in the United States and of course, everywhere else around the world. 
Indeed. Uh, all right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, Professor of Economics uh, at the New School for so so Social Research in New York City, Professor Clara Mate. Thank you. A short break now. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.